always love the smell of phenylalanine. Wait, that's not why we call it aromatic? Nope. Phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan are considered aromatic amino acids. This is because these protein letters in their side chain are a unique part. They have this special aromatic or aryl group, a resonant stabilized ring. The classic example of one of these is the molecule benzene. And if you stick one of those benzene rings onto an alanine, you would get phenylalanine. Um, and so phenylalanine is one of these amino acids that has this resonance. What this means is that in the side chain, you have these atoms, the carbons in a circle, like a ring. And in addition to making like normal bonds with one another, they make these special kinds of bonds, these pi bonds. And so these are the same type of bonds that you would see basically in a double bond, except in this case, the bond isn't just between two amino acids two atoms, not just between neighboring carbons, but between all of those carbons in the ring. So they're kind of, there's not enough for like a full double bond for all of them, but there's enough for like an almost double bond. So it's kind of like one of those, um, like they, they spend an, at, an electron to make a pair to their neighboring atom, but then they also have a little extra over, left over that they kind of donate into this commune. And then all of these atoms in the ring are able to share in, um, to, share that electron density and this electron density in order to be shared it has to be the molecule the atoms have to be in this special configuration where the electrons end up be sharing being shared kind of like a donut above and below the ring and just like you wouldn't want a soggy donut you don't want a soggy ring i guess basically these rings have to be planar in order for those in order for that special um sharing to happen because if you kind of try, were to try to twist the molecule well now those atoms the, the the donut kind of breaks and you can't actually get that sharing and so when we have an aromatic molecule it's going to be planar so it's going to be flat this is going to impact how it can interact with other things such as if DNA and other amino acids. It's also going to allow it to absorb UV light. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we can detect proteins with the UV detector. Uh, mainly that's due to the tryptophan, not the phenylalanine. But the phenylalanine is still super duper important. Um, phenylalanine is going to be used to make, most of it's going to be used to make amino acid tyrosine, which can then be used to make hormones, including adrenaline ah! and dopamine. And so phenylalanine is really important. And if there's problems breaking down phenylalanine, you get disorders like phenylketonuria or PKU. Um, so there's lots of different things that we can talk about in terms of phenylalanine, starting with this concept of aromaticity. Um, so this idea of electron destabilization or conjugation or resonance that's happening in a ring structure. So let's go and look in more detail. So this is phenylalanine and it gets its name because it's like a phenyl attached to an alanine. So alanine was one of the first amino acids we looked at. It's side chain, it just has this CH3 group. When we have a phenyl group, um, this is going to be kind of confusingly this. So this ring part is called benzene. And if, if you just attach a benzene to something, we call that a phenyl group. And if you attach a benzene plus a methylene group so with another like carbon linker, then we call it a benzyl group. Don't know why, um, but in this case, we have a benzyl group, but in terms of the naming, it's a phenyl group attached to an alanine um, pretty much. And so that's where we get this name, phenylalanine. But the side chain itself is going to be a benzyl group. And if we just had this ring by itself, we would call that a benzene ring. Now, what's special about this ring? It's aromatic. Um, and so that doesn't mean it smells nice. It means that it has this special property of having electron delocalization around a ring. Um, and so some of the other amer aromatic amino acids are tryptophan and tyrosine. And so you can see tyrosine looks a lot like phenylalanine, but it has a hydroxyl group. So it has this OH group. We'll look more at tyrosine in a later post, um, but you actually make tyrosine from phenylalanine. And most of the phenylalanine you eat um, is actually converted into tyrosine, which can then be used to make various hormones. So it's really important. And we'll talk later about how there's a disease called PKU, um, fetal quinonuria, um, where people can't break down phenylalanine. And this is why there are those like warnings on various foods um, that they, if they contain P phenylalanine. 
Um, so we'll get more into that. But first, let's talk about what this aromaticity actually means. So in order to understand this, we kind of need to understand what all of these dots are representing. And so these are all these, these C's, these H's, these are all different atoms of the element. So like carb of an, an atom of carbon, an atom of hydrogen. And each of these atoms are made up of smaller parts. We call these subatomic particles. Um, much more in other posts and outside the scope of things. Um, if you need background, um, you can go check out those other posts. But basically, the subatomic particles consist of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so protons are positively charged. The number of protons an atom has is going to define that element. So carbon has six protons, and oxygen has eight protons, for example. And then it's, these protons are held together with the help of these neutral neutrons, and they form, they hang out in this like dense central core called the nucleus. And then the electrons are these little negatively charged particles that float, that whiz around them. And these electrons can kind of, um, these atoms can share share electrons. When we say share electrons, what really happens is more like they're they're merging parts of their electron clouds. Um, and when they do this, they do this in order to form bonds, to form covalent bonds by sharing electrons. And so they're different. Um, atoms are going to want to share electrons in a way that kind of fulfills um, fulfills their desires. And there are various ways to represent where electrons are. We never know exactly where they are, um, but we can predict where they would most likely be. And we can do these using like orbital diagrams and um, and things like this, where we're basically trying to predict like, okay, the electrons, if you were to put a tracker on an electron, you would see it hangs out over here more, or it hangs out over there more. Um, and then you have these electron, um, these electronic orbitals. And it's much way too outside the scope of the post, except that these orbitals have characteristic shapes. And these characteristic shapes of the orbitals are going to influence what orientation the molecules need to be in in order to interact and to share um to share electrons with one another in order to merge those parts of their electron clouds um and so when we think about bonds a bond is a shared pair of electron and slot electrons and the double bond is when you have two pairs shared so what happens is that these these single and these double bonds, they actually have different orbital geometries. When you have those single bonds, here these electrons are going to be shared kind of head on in these circular orbitals. But when you have a double bond, you have a different shaped orbital. So you still have that single orbital, you still have that like normal orbital making that normal like sigma bond we call them with these S orbitals. Those are like your kind of like normal single bonds. But then the p orbitals, um, these are involved in making pi bonds. And so this could be a double, this is involved a double bond um, or a triple bond too. And these orbitals, these are actually going to be these kind of like hourglass glass shaped figures that go above and below the pain, plane of the molecule, above and below the plane of the single bond. So you have the single bond kind of being like a tube, and then you have these orbitals coming up and down. And so if you imagine in order, if you were to try to rotate around one of these single bonds, if this was just a single bond, you can rotate around single bonds. And so if you were to do that, though, then you would kind of your hourglasses would get off of orientation. And if your hourglasses are off of orientation, then you can't be sharing electrons between those clouds. If you can't be sharing electrons between those orbitals, well, then you don't have a bond. And so what happens is that in a double bond, you have to have it be a plane. You can't rotate around it. And we've seen this come up when we we're talking about the protein backbone and how we can't rotate around the protein backbone because you have partial, um, you have partial double bond character in that bond. And so if you have a double bond, you can't rotate around. And if you have partial double bond character, you can't rotate around. And so how do we get partial double bond character? Well, what I was showing you here in this aromatic ring these are actually, these are not like full double bonds. These are kind of like these partial double bonds because instead of having enough electrons for there to be a double bond between each of these different atoms, there's kind of almost enough. And so they're kind of pooling together their extra electrons. And so all of these are sharing the extra electrons. 
rather than the electrons just being shared between the neighboring atoms. So in a normal bond, in a normal single bond or a normal double bond, you have these electrons being shared by the atoms that are right next to each other. But in the case of conjugation or resonance, electron delocalization, these are all words that we can use to describe this, you have the electron density being shared among multiple among multiple atoms. So it's kind of like this commune. Um, you can think about it kind of like they have enough for to they all they all spend an electron to all these atoms spend an electron to pair with the thing next to them. And they do that through the single bond. But then they have leftovers. And so they kind of pool those leftovers together and contribute it to a general fund, kind of like one of those give a penny, take a penny type of things except that those pennies are always going to be available for everybody and everybody's always taking them because what's what's happening is that although we can draw like resonance structures where we can kind of draw alternating singles and double bonds so this would be like one person puts a penny in one person takes a penny out one person puts a penny in one person takes a penny out but the reality is more like those pennies are always there in that take a give a penny take a penny jar and they're always available um, for everybody to use because they're actually shared. So we can get conjugation where you have that sharing among multiple atoms. Um, and so we can get this to happen when we just have things in a line. And so we see this with the peptide bonds in amino acids. We see that we have partial double bond character in those bonds. And this is going to limit the rotation around those bonds because we have this partial double bond character. The rotation around them is going to be restricted because remember, if you rotate around a double bond, you can't you can't do that because you break those like the orbital those hourglasses are off of alignment. And so, although with a um, with this resonance with this electron delocalization, because you don't have like enough electrons for there to be like a true double bond. It's not quite as strong as a double bond. It's not quite as short as a double bond. It's kind of intermediate, um, but you have in, you still have those P orbitals involved. You still have those pi bonds involved and um, therefore you can't rotate around it and still maintain that, um, maintain that interaction. And that interaction is gonna be really stabilizing um, think about having all those orbitals lined up, um, that's going to be basically, yeah, it's going to stabilize the react the um the bond, which is why these peptide bonds are so sturdy and strong. And but it's also why you can't rotate around them and why the rotation around a peptide bond around the backbone of a protein is going to be limited to happening in between these peptide bonds. And the rotation is going to be then further limited by the nature of these side chains or R groups. And so when you have something big and bulky, like, you know, let me say, it's going to be even harder to, it's going to be hard to rotate even in the places where there is rotation. And more, if you have something little like glycine, which just has a hydrogen, it's going to be easier to rotate around. And this is why um, different proteins, um, different amino acids will take on like characteristic angles and you get characteristic structures and things like that. Um, and more on that in other posts. But going back to our idea of aromatic amino acids, when we're looking at that peptide bond, we are getting delocalization, um, but we are between this like oxygen, this carbon, and this nitrogen. Um, and we can also get something similar in a carboxylate. So when we have like two oxygens attached to a carbon and they're all kind of sharing. And so you might see a double bond drawn towards one of them or or the other, or both going back and forth, call these resonance structures. Um, but the reality is something in between. Um, we just don't have a good way to draw that. And so sometimes we can draw it with like a dotted line or something. But in these cases, what we're having is we're happen having that happening in a plane. So remember that plane is why we can't like rotate around those um, the, pept the peptide bonds. Um, this has to be in a plane. So that was in a straight chain. But you can also get this in the circle, and in the circle, then we call it aromatic. So aromaticity is not just having resonance, it's not just having that delocalization, because we saw that a peptide bond had that, and it wasn't aromatic. And it's not just, have, and it has to have a, be in a ring. But it can't just, it's not just that it's a ring, it's a ring where you have this, um, this configuration where you're able to share the electrons throughout all of them. And so often this, when you see uh, something with like alternating double and single bonds, this is representing something with resonance 
we just don't have a good way to represent um, the reality that it's not really alternating single and double bonds. It's really something more that's more shared. And so sometimes you can see it drawn with like a dotted line or with a circle in the middle, um, or you see it with these resonant structures where they're kind of shifting back and forth. Um, and sometimes this can be helpful in order to think about it shifting back and forth um, when you're trying to draw out reactions. Um, but yes, so this would be an example of an aromatic um, compound. Um, the classic one is like benzene. And if we attach a benzene onto something, we call it, we call that a phenyl group. Um, and if it's attached with the carbon linker, then we call it a benzyl group. Um, and so these are examples of functional groups. When we think about functional groups, um, these are basically things other than just the generic hydrocarbon skeleton. So our most so organic molecules for something to be organic, that doesn't mean it's grown without pesticides. It means that it's based on a hydrocarbon skeleton, at least when we're talking about like chemistry and biochemistry and stuff. Um, and so this hydrocarbon skeleton is going to form the backbone of all the various molecules that we talk about, but it's kind of blah. And that's kind of like the point. Um, you want to emphasize the, the cool things, right? Um, and so then just have like a generic skeleton backbone. And so we saw with, in the case of amino acids, how we have like a hydrocarbon, but then we also had like amino groups and we had, we had um, carboxylic acid groups. And so these are all examples of functional groups. They're basically, you can swap out these, think of these hydrogens as kind of place holders, and you can swap out various functional groups for them. And a lot of the times though, like that these functional groups are going to have um, have hetero atoms, so have things that aren't carbon or have things that aren't hydrogen. So we see nitrogen and we see sulfur and we see oxygen. But in the case of these um, these functional groups, these aromatic functional groups, these are still hydrocarbons. They're just carbons and hydrogens, but they have that special property where they have that aromaticity. So they have these rings, they have with these electron destabilization. And remember, if you have electron destabilization, then these things are also going to be planar. So they're going to be flat because you can't rotate around and still maintain, um, maintain those orbitals in, in the right orientation. So these are also going to have special properties, like they're going to absorb UV light. Um, and this is going to help us detect, um, detect the presence of proteins, such as if you're purifying a protein and you're watching the UV absorbance trace as your protein comes off um, to see what um, to see where the protein is, you're looking for the UV light being absorbed by these amino acids, by the aromatic amino acids, um, including phenylalanine, but mostly tryptophan. Um, also as well as tyrosine. And so this, this absorbance of the UV light is because they have that aromatic property. Um, this aromatic property is not just found in the proteins though, um, it's also found in other biological molecules, including your nucleotides. So your base, the bases of your DNA and your RNA, adenine, thymine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine, these have um, this, these are aromatic bases as well. And this mean this, so they're going to have this flat structure, and they're actually going to be able to then interact with these aromatic amino acids and kind of stack their rings on top of one another. So when we talk about like DNA structure, we're often thinking about like the the base pairing. So like one base to another base, like kind of edge on. But what happens is that actually like your double helix, like the reason, the main reason why GC's regions are more stable than a AU region or AT regions isn't just that you have these three bonds instead of two. It's not those hydrogen bonds. It's really the base stacking interactions are more favorable. And the base stacking is basically the different rungs on the ladder, so those different bases. So that because they're aromatic, they have to be flat. They have to be planar. And so they kind of line up with one another. And if we go back to looking at the at the structure of something that's aromatic, if we look at where those electrons are hanging out, well, they're hanging out above and below the plane. They're hanging out at those kind of like this, the center of the outer, or the bottom of the outer glass, the fattest part, the part where you're most likely to find electrons. That's going to be above and below the plane. Um, and so if you have this electrons delocalized like this, well, now what can happen is that you can have these electron clouds kind of sync up between the electrons 
between the um, between the different bases, between the different aromatic rings. Um, and you can kind of get if so, say if the electrons kind of randomly happen to shift over here more um, then the ones on top of it can shift up a little um, and you can get a kind of chain reaction effect um, where you have these all get in sync. Um, and this is going to make it so that you have those interactions. You can have these bases kind of like interpolate with one another. And so we actually see like some of the DNA staining dyes, they have a flat structure. They have an aromatic structure that actually allows them to interpolate or kind of slip in between the different bases of the DNA. And similarly, we can see the amino acids um, and aromatic amino acids be used to kind of bind DNA and bind RNA. Um, because they're able to form those base, um, those base to like aromatic to aromatic interactions. Um, so that's one place that this aromaticity um, comes into play. So the aromaticity is going to allow it to absorb UV light so we can see it. It's going to make it so that it's planar um, because it well it, ha it has to be planar in order to be aromatic, um, but it, then it's also going to allow it to absorb UV light and to interact with other aromatic things through a sort of base stacking interactions. Um, and so the aromatic amino acids are tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. So as I mentioned, these basically, well, you see there's nitrogen and tryptophan and there's an oxygen and tyrosine, but if you look at phenylalanine, it only has a hydrocarbon skeleton. So it's, we called it a functional group, but remember I was saying like functional groups, they often have another another atom in them but they have bit, but because it's aromatic it has a special property but um because it's this basically just a pure hydrocarbon and the other aromatic amino acids were still mostly hydrocarbons this means that they're going to be hydrophobic for the most part um so when you have a um when you have a tyrosine it's going to be less so because it has an oxygen and tryptophan, it has that nitrogen, but it still has all this other hydrocarbon stuff. Um, so it's going to be um, very hydrophobic. And phenylalanine, it's one of the most hydrophobic amino acids there is because it only has hydrocarbons. And so when we talk about hydrophobicity, this is basically with, with the, whether water will like will hang out with it. And so water molecules are polar. So when they're sharing electrons, they don't share them fairly. And so for example, in um, the oxygens, what we call electronegative, it's going to hog those electrons, making the oxygen partly negative and the hydrogens partly positive. Now, the water is going to like to hang out with other water molecules and kind of organize itself in a way where the partial charges are getting to interact with one another. They're only going to let things into their network if those things also have some charge or partial charge. That is, if those things are also polar, if they're charged. I and mean, we call those type of things hydrophilic, um, whereas things that don't are hydrophobic. And so when it comes to hydrocarbons, hydrogen and carbon share the, the, their electrons when they form bonds, they share them pretty fairly. And so you don't have that separation of charge, you don't have polarity, and therefore you're hydrophobic if you're water avoided. And so these regions of the, are typically going to be found, these amino acids are typically going to be found on the inside of proteins. And so phenylalanine is going to be highly um, hydrophobic. Um, and so we saw a lot of hydrophobic amino acids here. Um, and we saw a lot, we can also classify them as like nonpolar. Um, but when we talk about the ones that we've seen before, if you look at isoleucine, leucine, valine, we looked at those, you can see that these have hydrocarbons as well. But these hydrocarbons, they might be, they might be in like chains or they might have branches but they're just like chains. So they're a straight chain or they branch chain, but they're just a chain. They're not a circle. If we have um, something that's just like a chain um, or it's a non-aromatic ring, we call this aliphatic. If a hydrocarbon that is like a chain or is a ring, but it's not resonance stabilized, it's not aromatic, we call it aliphatic. And if it's aromatic, we can also call this an aryl. So we would call these like an aryl or aromatic groups. Um, and as opposed to these, which would be um, aliphatic. Okay, some other cool things about phenylalanine. 
as I mentioned before, phenylalanine is basically most of the phenylalanine in your body is used to make another amino acid. It's used to make tyrosine. And then that tyrosine can be used to make other things. It can be used to make L-dopa and dopamine, noradrenaline and adrenaline. And I'll talk more about these when I talk about tyrosine. Um, it can also be used to make thyroid hormones and melanin, all sorts of different stuff. So phenylalanine is really important because tyrosine is really important and you need phenylalanine to get tyrosine, at least for the most part. Um, and what happens is that though there's, um, there's this disease called phenylketonuria. And basically there's, in order to turn phenylalanine into tyrosine, there's an enzyme, so there's a reaction helper called phenylalanine hydroxylase. And so phenylalanine hydroxylase or PAH is going to do this conversion. If there's a problem with this PAH, then there's going to be a problem generating tyrosine. And if there's a problem generating tyrosine, well, then there's a problem generating all of these different hormones. Um, and what's going to happen is that you're going to also get a lot of phenylalanine building up. And so when you have a lot of phenylalanine building up, it's going to give you breakdown in alternative ways. It's going to give you... Um, that's going to give you things, including phenyl ketones, which is where we get this name, phenyl ketone urea. Um, and so urea is talking about that this is building up and you can find it in the blood, I mean, in the urine. Um, and yeah, this pathway is also going to use up shared resources and it's going to throw off the energy production, as well as not having the tyrosine that you need. And so this is a, um, this is a genetic disorder um, that is caused by mutations in PAH. And there are other disorders of um, tyrosine um, making and breaking that are caused by mutations in different enzymes. So you can get like alcoptinuria and tyrosine, tyrosinemia um, and things like that. Um, and so normally though, um, phenylalanine is broken down like this. From it, you can get fumarate as well as sulfumeric acid as well. If you break down phenylalanine, um, well, you first get tyrosine, and then if you break down tyrosine, um, you end up with getting um, fumarate as well as acetyl-acetyl-CoA. Um, and so fumarate is a component of the tricarboxylic acid cycle, so it's called the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. We often talk about this in terms of breaking down, breaking down molecules, like breaking down pyruvate that you got from gluco, um, from glycolysis. So breaking down sugar, and then you get pyruvate, which then you can make into acetyl CoA, which goes into the cycle. The other day, I talked about how this cycle can also be used to make glucose because it gives you oxaloacetate, which can kind of be siphoned away from this pathway. So instead of going around and around the circle to generate um, reducing equivalent, so like NADH and stuff, that can then be used to cash in with the electron transport chain and make ATP. So you get energy. If you take this oxaloacetate out of the pathway, you can use it to make glucose. And so if something gives breaks down, an amino acid can be broken down into something that's a component of this TCA, then we call that thing glucogenic because this can be used to make glucose, to make blood sugar. And if something gives you acetyl-CoA or acetyl-acetyl-CoA, those can be used to make lipids or they can also be converted into ketone bodies, which are kind of these alternative energy sources um, that can travel through the blood um, and they can also be used to make lipids, um, like as a kind of intermediate to travel through the bloodstream um, and then later be converted into lipids and it can be breakdown products of lipids and stuff. So we call things that make these ketogenic because they can make these ketone bodies. And I talk much more about this in another post, but basically we see with phenylalanine, it's making one of each. And so we call it both glucogenic and ketogenic. Phenylalanine is also essential. So our bodies can't make it ourselves. So we need to get it through our diet and then we need to get, um, make tyrosine from it. So it's really important. Um, and essential just means that our body can't make it itself. We need all of the amino acids, even the ones that we consider dietarily non-essential. Phenylalanine was also essential to the discovery of core um, principles of biology and biochemistry. So some of my favorite experiments were the Nuremberg and Mathai experiments that were trying to figure out, crack the genetic code, um, figure out which different um, which different nucleotides, so what DNA and RNA letters spell what protein letters. And so 
um, much more on this in other posts, but basically there's these famous like poly U experiment where they put in a bunch of RNA that was all just the letter U, 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 U. Um, and then they were able to show that U, 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 U um, made phenylalanine. And it's this U, U, U is the codon for phenylalanine um, or one of the codons for phenylalanine. Um, and so it's also coded for by U, U, C. But if you have U, U, U in there, no matter what your reading frame is and much more in other posts, but basically that's going to give you phenylalanine. And so these are some really cool classic experiments and I'll link to the post on that. Um, but yeah, so phenylalanine is one of the aromatic amino acids. Um, so remember, it, it has basically, it has those hourglass things above and below it. And those hourglass things are those pi, those p orbitals of those pi bonds um, where those electrons are likely to be hanging out. And so you have electrons shared in between these atoms and those sigma, those head-on bonds, as well as those hourglasses, those pi bonds. And in those pi bonds, they kind of merge together to give you like a donut above and below the ring. And in order to have that donut be like a donut, you can't like turn your donut. It has to be flat. Um, so they're planar. Aromatic amino acids are planar. Aromatic groups are planar. And you get this resonant stabilization. It's called stabilization because it really does make it more stable. Um, and you can also call it like delocalization because those electrons are delocalized among these different ones. We also, another word is like conjugation. Um, but all of this is happening in phenylalanine in this benzyl group. Um, and it's also going to allow it to absorb UV light and interact with other aromatic things through kind of like stacking interactions where they sync up their sync up that sync up their donuts. Um, and so yes, and it's also hydrophobic because it's just got this like hydrocarbon um, and it's nonpolar because hydrogen and carbogen, uh, carbon these are all just like shared barely. So basically, you've just got a bunch of like shared electron density. <laughs> Um, and so it wouldn't seem that special, um, but it is special because it's got the aromatic properties. Um, and it's also big and bulky, so it's hard to rotate around and stuff. It's really important. Um, you need to you need to get it through your diet and you need to use it to make tyrosine, which you need to make other things. Um, and if you have problems breaking down phenylalanine, then you can have big problems um, if you don't have like a, follow a special diet and things like that. So phenylalanine, uh, PHE, and the initial is F. Um, and so I hope this helps you give an F without being alone.